Hey there, kids. It's me, Mr. Creepypasta. And tonight I'm going to bring you the first episode of a bit of an experiment. I've been wanting to mess around with a little bit of true crime story time for a couple of months now. And I think I might have gotten my first of a few scripts together. So if you enjoy this kind of content, and if you'd like to see more, please leave a like on the video and leave a comment letting me know if you've enjoyed it and if there's any other cases you'd like to see discussed in the future. Secrets are one of the many things that ties together as human beings. And some of those secrets can be as small as a little, little white lie intended to protect those around you. Or they can be the darkest and grimmest of skeletons in your closet. Tonight's true crime story is how a secret can grow out of control and become quite deadly. Charles Morgan age 39, was a successful businessman who owned and was the president of his own escrow agency. It had been stated that he was a potential witness in a land fraud case against a highly known crime boss. On the day of March 22, 1977, Morgan left his home in Tucson, Arizona to take his two daughters to school. He disappeared after dropping them off for three days. Three days after the original disappearance, Morgan came back home at two in the morning. His wife, Ruth Morgan, stated that he had been missing a shoe, had a plastic handcuff around his ankle, and had his hands bound by a zip tie. Charles could not speak, and had to use a pen and paper to communicate. He stated that he had been kidnapped and tortured. Morgan also stated that the inside of his throat had been coated by a hallucinogenic drug. Morgan claimed that the drug would cause him to go insane or possibly kill him, if he ingested it. Charles asked his wife to move his car for him because he did not want them to know he was back at home. He never stated who the mystery people were. He also instructed Ruth to not contact the police or go to the hospital as it could result in a hit being placed on them and their families. For an entire week, Ruth aided Charles. She fed him with an eyedropper in order to prevent any discomfort before Charles regained his voice, he hinted at a secret identity. Morgan claimed that he was an agent that worked for the federal government. He stated that his work revolved around fighting organized crime. He stated that the mystery people he did not want to know he had returned had taken his treasury identification. Due to the events during his kidnapping, Charles became paranoid. He started to wear bulletproof vests as well as driving his daughters to and from school every day. He told the school that only he could be the one to pick them up, and they cannot allow anyone else to do so. Two months after the first incident, Charles disappeared again. Before he disappeared for the second time, Morgan told his father if anything were to happen to him, he had written a letter that would reveal who was responsible for everything. Although the letter was never found, nine days after his disappearance, an unknown woman called Ruth. The woman stated, quote, Chuck is all right. Ecclesiastics 12, 1 through 8. The reference the woman was making is from a Bible passage that states, Men are afraid of a high place and of terror on the road. Remember him before the silver cord is broken and the golden bowl is crushed. Then the dust will return to earth as it was, and the spirit will return to God, who gave it. Two days after the mysterious phone call, Charles Morgan was found shot to death in the desert, still wearing his bulletproof vest. Morgan was shot once in the back of the head with a bullet from his own gun, a 357 Magnum. His gun was found next to his body. In Morgan's car, local police found a note with directions to the crime scene, written in his own handwriting. They also found a pair of sunglasses that did not belong to Morgan. Charles had clipped a $2 bill to the inside of his underwear. On the front of the bill, 
had seven Spanish names written on it, ranging from letters A to G. With the names, Ecclesiastics 12 was also written, with verses 1 through 8, marked with arrows drawn on the bill serial number. This was connected to the phone call Ruth received from the unknown female caller. On the back of the bill, the signers of the Declaration of Independence were number 1 through 7, as well as crude drawings of a map with several roads between Tucson and the Mexican border. The towns Robles Junction and Sasabe were marked and were well known for high amounts of smuggling. Two days after Morgan's death, an unknown woman spoke to an officer at the Pima County Sheriff's Department over the phone. This woman claimed that Charles was supposed to meet her at a local motel before he died. She stated that her nickname was Green Eyes, and that she was the same woman that had called Ruth to tell her Charles was okay and the Bible verse. This unknown woman stated that Charles showed her a briefcase that contained several thousand dollars in cash at a motel they agreed to meet at. Morgan stated that the money was needed to buy him out of a gang contract that was placed on his life. Despite the evidence and the circumstances, Charles Morgan's death was ruled a suicide. Although the authorities believed and filed his death as such, his family and reporter Don DeVero believed he was murdered. Ruth Morgan stated that there is no way Chuck would have committed suicide, and if he had ever contemplated suicide, he would have left a letter for his girls and for me. Don DeVero stated, I've never seen in all of my years as a journalist a fellow take himself out in the desert wearing a bulletproof vest and shoot himself in the back of the head. Other investigators also believed his death was suspicious, however they could not change the ruling. Three weeks after Morgan's death, two men claiming to be FBI agents came to his home. These two men tore through Morgan's home and searched for a lengthy amount of time. It is not known if they have ever found anything in the home. Ruth stated about the encounter that, quote, they opened and closed their identification very fast. They said they wanted to come in and look through the house. They never said what they were looking for. And to this day, I don't even know what they were looking for. DeVero contacted the FBI to gain more insight on why they sent agents to Charles Morgan's home. Their response was that they have never heard of Charles Morgan and did not send anyone to his home. The murder of Charles Morgan still remains unsolved. The case appeared on an episode of Unsolved Mysteries on February 7th of 1990. After the case aired on the show, several phone calls were received in relation to the Morgan case. Don DeVero investigated multiple leads as a result of the airing. DeVero learned that Charles Morgan was heavily involved in the money laundering activities through his escrow company in Tucson. Starting in 1973 and ending when he died, Morgan was also involved in a large amount of gold and platinum transactions. He had received a large amount of money from doing these transactions, and some of the money he received apparently came from Southeast Asia. DeVero discovered that Morgan had duplicate records of the illegal transactions. He now believes that Morgan was killed because of the records that he possessed. Although Charles states that he worked against organized crime, some believe that he was actually involved in it. In the 1970s, Tucson and other cities in Arizona became a mafia powerhouse, since Arizona is warm in climate and, at the time, had a controversial criminal justice system. The Mafia was immediately drawn to this location. The Mafia movings began with former New York Don Joseph Bonanno. After he moved to Arizona, more than 500 racketeers moved to Tucson in the 70s. The influx of Mafia members led to an increase of gangland-style killings in the area, including the infamous murder of the investigative reporter Don Bowles. Crime syndicates were interested in Arizona's unique state law that allowed the purchasing of land using numbered blind trust accounts. This allowed Mafia members to remain anonymous and successfully launder money at the same time. It was stated that Charles Morgan completed real estate escrow work for at least one Mafia family. It is theorized that this Mafia may have used Charles to perform escrow work for the purchases of gold bullions and platinum. This would be an easier way for the Mafia to launder money. It appeared that Charles began his escrow work in 1973, 
It appeared that he had several million dollars of escrow work in bullions and platinum. However, in actuality, there was not any bullion or platinum being dealt with. The money was being moved through several escrow accounts, thus making it legitimized. At one point, Charles mentioned to Ruth that money laundering was happening in Tucson. He also stated that he was not involved in the money laundering schemes. Charles also believed and stated that the less his family knew about his activities, the better it would be for all involved. It is commonly believed that Charles Morgan was murdered by members of organized crime in the Tucson area. It is possible that the mafia that Charles Morgan worked for had him killed for knowing too much information about their business and practices. One common theory is suggested that one of the organized crime bosses put out that they wanted Morgan dead. In this theory, it is suggested that a hitman, believed to have been hired to kill him, told Morgan of the situation. This resulted in Morgan obtaining the money to buy off the hitman. When the two men met in the desert outside of Tucson, the man killed Morgan, regardless of the deal, and took the money. This is all but a theory, and has not been confirmed. At the end of the day, kids, what I'd like you to take away from tonight's story is, no matter how flashy, no matter how glamorous, how adventurous, or even what the rewards could be, go into every secret and go into every possible threat with caution. <laughs>